for the action, action phase. Did you just do anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, the French, French game has <laughs> always been celebrated for its excellence. There is a California champagne by Paul Masson, inspired by that same French excellence. It's fermented in the bottle, and like the best French champagne, it's vintage dated. So, Paul Masson. 102, take three. Action, please. Ah, the French champagne has always been celebrated for its excellence. There is a California champagne by Paul Masson, inspired by that same French excellence. It's fermented in the bottle, and like the best French champagne, it's vintage dated. So Scott. Paul Masson. <laughs> Man, I love this uh, movie night extravaganza. <laughs> <laughs> it's a film podcast <laughs> online that exists on the website, YouTube. Um, all right. Well, uh, this is movie night extravaganza. <laughs> I am, uh, you know, Harry Lime Forrest Miller over here. Um, and I had three three people, you know, uh, carry me across the road to the uh, Emperor Yosef statue that um, exists on the other side of the street. So I'm going to introduce them now and then go to the, uh, the trailer. Good. And I guess I did this just so I could play that bit at the very beginning. Um, <laughs> I tried out the new format. You just have to come up with a bit that I need to try and then, you know, yeah. Just, just See, go with it and explain it. Break, break in format. <laughs> <laughs> for for, for right, maybe well, one of the best commercial reads of all time, right? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Exactly. You know, probably the best commercial read of all time. I mean, at least, you know, yeah. real life one. I would also put a uh, vitamin vegemin up there, you know, similar, that's quite, similar that's quality. Feet, but uh, yeah. I-, I wonder if there's any drunk outtakes for uh, his, uh, his role in Transformers the movie. Oh, oh God. God. <laughs> <laughs> you and the Kron. What the shit? <laughs> well, well I'm, makes I, am, no sense. I am joined by uh, the Baron himself, J. Andrew World. Uh, artist, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, dandy about town, I guess, I would, how I would describe that character. I don't think that we really get that much information about him besides that. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, that dog, you know, really, really does a lot of work. Yeah, no, that dog is the real, is the real, uh, the real actor in that situation. The really heavy lifter in this outfit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that actor that looks like a vulture, and I always found that incredibly creepy. Like something about the way he's perched, because like the Dutch angles in this movie are so insane. Oh yeah, and the way that he's like perched on his thing with the with the bird or with the uh, with the dog on dog. his like kind of like right here all the time yeah. reminded me of, like a vulture, and it really creeped me out when I first saw it. Very but, Snoopy uh, on the doghouse. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glowering, you know. Big Snoopy vibes. Right. Um, Please the dance later on in the movie. <laughs> also joined by, you know, the Romanian himself, uh, Protonic Reversal host. We have a, a second Protonic Reversal host here too, but main host <laughs> of, of Protonic Reversal. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, Conan Neutron and the Secret Friends, co-host of this show from Romania. How's it going? Yeah, yeah, I'm clearly the absurd man, so I, I had to have that be my <laughs> moniker uh, for for this evening. Uh, great, yeah, stoked to be discussing this. This is uh, this is a great film, and I'm loving that all the the movies that we're doing so far are very unique, very interesting. You know, like very very iconically uh, filmed, and yeah. uh, this is this one is no different. So uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm very very stoked to get down to it, and uh, yeah, as as mentioned. Uh, we, we, it's a special treat because I get to broadcast with Josh again. It's been a hot minute. <laughs> that it has. Is and that I my intro? Say that Josh, is Josh <laughs> Davis, one, you know, frequently on Red Letter Media's Best of the Worst. I made sure not to say the best of the worst. I made sure I want that known. Best of the worst. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a high five basis and former co host of Protonic Reversal. Uh, um, yes. Thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Me. Uh, Conan just got in touch with me and asked if I wanted to be on the show. Obviously, I spend some time on the internet talking about movies on occasion, but I never get to talk about 
one that's anywhere near this good. Right. Yeah, you, you don't really get to talk about ones that are not let's much, just say not not, the, not the same quality. Not the same quality level. Not the same quality. Yeah, we, yeah. we can definitely say that. Not not necessarily shot with the same care or uh, scripted <laughs> or acted or all the other things that make a movie. I, I, feel I like, do. Yeah. I, was, I do contend that Miami Connection is a pretty astounding piece of filmmaking. Absolutely, but not in the same way. Not in the same way. Though. Yeah, not in the same <laughs> way. I, I feel like I it could be an interesting that. conversation later on in this, too. Um, I feel like this movie had the potential to not be good. Like, I feel like there's just so many moving mm -hmm. parts to it. There's so yes. many incredibly creative people that worked on it, right? Between um, Graham Greene, Carol Reed, you know, just the fact that Orson Welles is there, who notoriously is a guy that says, like, uh, you're not doing that right. Like, you know what I mean? That's like one of his big things on set in every movie he's ever um, acted in. So mm. it kind of feels like this movie could have, could have, all the things that Wait. work in it could have easily not worked. You know Am I, mean? I Orson like, Welles? <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey. yes, you are. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to play this trailer. This is not a very, act. this is a very weird trailer. I, I, you know, this is one of the few times that I like actually watched the trailer. I went, oh, this is not a trailer for the movie that we are watching whatsoever. This is a strange way to sell this movie because it does not have anything to do with the movie itself, really. man hated by a thousand men desired by one woman <laughs> the third man, hanging, just one too good for him nothing is too good for the third man <laughs> her man was the third man the man on every woman's lips <laughs> Vienna, 1950, a city fearful of its present, uncertain of its future. Vienna, the once gay capital of a light-hearted people. Here in the shadows of its palaces and ruins is told with tenderness, drama, and suspense. The story of the third man. There was a third man there. I suppose that doesn't sound peculiar to you. I'm not interested in whether a racketeer like Lyme was killed by his friends or by an accident. The only important thing is that he's dead. Third Man, the story of two men and one woman caught in the dangerous web of an international love affair. Oh, please, for heaven's sake, stop making him in your image. Harry was real. He wasn't just your friend and my lover. No, I don't know. I'm just a hack writer who drinks too much and... Falls in love with girls. You? <laughs> Me? Don't be such a fool, of course. The third man. Joseph Cotton in his most successful performance. As an American caught in a whirlpool of continental intrigue. The glamorous valley is the mysterious Viennese actress who knew the secret of the third man. So mysterious, she's misplaced her first name. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel like somebody was getting like, hey, we will pay you if you can mention the movie's title as many times as possible. <laughs> That's what I feel like. A hundred dollars for every mention of the movie's title. Yeah, exactly. Get. It's like, hey, don't pay me a salary. Around. Just watch how many times I can fit it in in this preview. I'm the, <laughs> the amazing thing, too, is like, like it started off like a, a, a perfume commercial from the 80s. You know, oh, yeah. yeah. One woman desires him. All men fit. Yeah, that generic, like, <laughs> all, men with, like all men with the third uh, man from Calvin Klein. <laughs> all men with an infection fear him because you know, <laughs> he's poisoning the antibi antibiotic supply in the yeah, entire yeah. city. <laughs> oh, man. That's a fucked up detail, by the way. The third man. <laughs> yeah, like, like it, it does have that breathy sort of, yeah, perfume commercials, right? I mean, that's just, I don't even. I, I I don't even get it. Like I don't even get why somebody be like, "Yep, that's that's it. That's the trailer. Send it off." 
Yeah, I the, said the, irony, the irony, and this might be why the trailer is like that. If if they did have any say in it, um, David Selznick hated the title "The Third Man" and says, "Why the, that's not a good movie title?" He said, "A good movie title is something like One Night in Vienna or something like that, like something just really generic." <laughs> that's also not good. <laughs> yeah, but it, but I, I think it would be funny if you know they had been like, "Listen, say the third man as many times as you want, and if we sell this movie." Maybe Selznick will cut down on the speed a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. There's no promises, but maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's uh, – so first of all, I I want to thank you for, for uh, doing the format that I've been trying to get you to do for forever because I think it's great to actually – just react only to the trailer, not have to do the intros with it. Because especially when a trailer is nuts like that, like we've seen good trailers, we've seen, I don't know, not so good trailers. That That's definitely one of the weirder ones, I think, which is yeah. crazy. Because it's like, I feel like this is, but then also like, what kind of trailer do you do for this movie? Like you show some Dutch angles, you show like, maybe you show like, <laughs> you gotta make sure to do that. Well, the... <laughs> you, 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 well, there's you... gotta be some zither. Yeah, of course. Sure. But like, you're you emphasizing that the soundtrack was very popular. You do want to emphasize that. That's fair. Yeah. 20 million copies I saw got sold. <laughs> Whew. That they uh, they re-released it on like Apple music and stuff and probably Spotify too. I'm guessing they re-released it like last year. Wow, yeah. it's yeah. having a having a big resurgence. Yeah, it was very dubstep remix. Oh, there <laughs> there's even a there's even a bit in the uh, Get Back documentary where John Lennon's playing it on acoustic. You're right. Yeah. I, you're right. I forgot about that. Topical. Mm. It's very popular. Very popular yeah. indeed. Hey, you hear about these Beatles, Paul? They're very popular. <laughs> <laughs> Dave. So, so this is I, I found um this this. This is the guy giving a performance. Anton Karas, I think is his name. Uh, this yeah, is yeah. him giving a performance on his zither. And I did not know this is how a zither uh, gets played. But I thought mm -hmm. that it, it's interesting to Oh, it's this. wild. And since yeah, we have two it's... musicians on the panel, you guys brought your zithers, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> must have that zither with his zither. <laughs> that comes zither hage. Yeah. <laughs> Remember this? Well, these are the hands that played it. This is the man, Mr. Anton Karras, seen here at London's Empress Club.
Yeah, way better trailer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, a, what, a, what is a this far about? more appropriate, a far more appropriate trailer, I think, than what we saw. Well, yeah, what I love about that shots. is is he's yeah. like yeah, this little bookish nerd, you know, with these thick, thick glasses, you know, all buttoned up tight, sweating profusely while he's just, you know, rocking out on the zither. Just going and to then, town and there's the these zither. women staring at him like he's Mario Lanza or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this slaps. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't I don't like this because it was British. It's, like yeah. it's like a British audience. So like they kind of weren't paying that much attention to it. No, like well, they, they think that the Mario Lanza is also Irish, so you know. No, Mario I'm saying- Lanza. <laughs> <laughs> Mario. Um yeah. Screaming no. Heavenly Creatures callback, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which have you creatures no within that movie, they watched the third man. So and you know, play that they song. Did yeah. Yes. That's right. That's right. And w- and we're uh, we're chasing their imagination by the Orson Welles of, of the third man. The most Orson hideous Welles. man alive. Exactly. <laughs> the most hideous man alive, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like burst into flame immediately. <laughs> so I see I think he melt or something or no, that was the clay. I've been getting it mixed up. I haven't seen Heavenly Creatures in a while. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard to watch. We it was uh, we covered it um ooh, like last month. No. Uh, uh, maybe two months ago. ago. Two months ago, yeah. yeah. But I, I feel like it was like it, it's in need of a release somewhere because it was kind of difficult. Criterion find. Channel needs to do something with it. Yeah, Criterion. There you go. Uh, hey. And then they, and then they can attach disc. it to the third man. Like you know, sometimes they do it where like if a movie's referenced or something, it. they yeah, put it within yeah. the same playlist. They could do that. There you go. There you yeah. go. Absolutely. Put some classic Mario Lanza shorts. <laughs> yeah. If there's any film of him, I don't actually know. I don't know anything about him other than he's the opera singer from the movie. Mario Lanza. <laughs> I know that I know that it's, it's good music to sing into a fish too. I know yes. that much about it. Um, yes. I so I think it's interesting though that the trailer for this movie, um, the third man, the movie that we're you know, yeah, not heavenly later. creatures, which is an earlier episode, and you can you can watch that whenever you want or listen. Hey. To it. Yeah. Okay. Um, don't don't turn away. So but don't so, turn this off to do that. Yeah. I yeah. think it's interesting that they say, like, uh, you know, the once gay people of Vienna. And then they're like, well, they fear, uh, you know, they fear their future and they're afraid of the past. Because, you know, this is a post-war movie. And this is, like, probably the the quintessential depiction of the kind of dystopian, um, you know, bombed out remains of mm-hmm. a city like Vienna that was kind of at the center of all of this action. And it's kind of awesome that they managed to capture that, right? Like, it's, it's pretty amazing that... Um, you know, they get to go into the city and it's so perfect for a noir movie because the shadows of things that have just been bombed out and there's rubble and things like it's kind of amazing. Like, you know, it's a really old city and all of the, you know, pieces of, of architecture from, you know, centuries ago have been bombed out completely. And it's just like it feels like the perfect setting for a noir film. It's sure. part of the reason why like Budapest was like this big thing in the 90s where, where everybody filmed their stuff there because because yeah. of the gorgeous architecture. Um and I got, you know, like, like uh, it reminded me a little bit of uh, of that. Plus, you know, it, it is beautifully shot. Like, like um, I'm going to I'm going to mock some of it later. But but uh, I just want to make sure it's, it's it looks way better than an episode of Doctor Who. Um, <laughs> I'm going to compare the movie to Doctor Who. Wow. <laughs> the, third, okay. the third the third doctor. Uh, yeah, actually, know. yes, the third Not doctor. Yeah. With, All right. with, um, with the brigadier and uh, Sergeant uh, Benton. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, yeah, yeah, with Doctor Who. I do th- uh, I do think it's actually very you, nice that they were able to shoot it you know at, at, that qu- that close to the war too because even five years down the road there might have been enough rebuilt that they didn't like have the spaces and didn't kind of have that same feel of like it definitely still feels very close to the war like bombed out and and they yeah, have yeah, those right after it yeah within, yeah like within like, five yeah, years. four or five years exactly so they have those like spaces to shine the light through and have the access to things they might not have access to even just a few years down the road. So it definitely is important that it was able to be shot when it was for, for the look of it, I, I think. Yeah, and I don't know of any other movie that really is able to depict that, right? Like, I don't know of any other movie filming in that. I mean, I'm sure there are, like, German films, well, and I'm sure that there are. Yeah. Battle of Italian, uh, uh, Italy did a lot of that, right? Uh, that was really Well, I mean, I mean specifically World War II. And I mean, World like, War II, no, 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 yeah. like, post, yeah. post-war uh, Italy had, mm-hmm. like, a, a, a film resurgence. Um, oh, it was yeah. like Italian realism, I think it's called, or something. Yeah, like yeah. All right. So I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't thinking about, but <laughs> sure, yeah, if you know. look at, so, um, yeah. Oh, gosh, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, movie about a really old fella that can't, has a 
really terrible day and he has a dog. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> a boy and his dog? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm blanking on the name, but it's, yeah, it's definitely still Omega shot. Man? Shot. <laughs> hey, post war, you know? I, I, it is post war. You didn't specify. <laughs> the, uh, is it the Italian John Wick? <laughs> oh, God. No, thank God. The dog, the dog lives. Spoilers. <laughs> which, which, by the way, I think Dolph Lundgren starred in because, like, he's been doing nothing but like Italian movies where he just sneaks around Italian castles. Which wow. I killed my dog. I, I didn't hey, know that I was a thing, now. but that is a genre <laughs> of, uh, of Dolph Lundgren movies. So I remember the name. Rabbit hole. It's Umberto D. Uh, yeah. But it's yeah, definitely an Italian uh, neorealist film, I've, and I've shot definitely that. shot in I've that. I've heard of that movie. I haven't yeah. seen it, but it's oh, that's what fantastic. Was. If you really need just if if you're having one of those days where you're just like, I need to cry, but I can't get it out of me, that movie will do just yeah. fine. <laughs> well, I'm glad we're staying on topic tonight. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, but the, the, we are. Um, I mean, you're talking about. No, the, I, know, you know, I know. No, I'm just kidding. I just post war like, bombed out. You know, it, it definitely. Funny. 20 minutes before the show, Conan messaged me. I was like, we need to make sure to stay on topic tonight. <laughs> but I, I think this actually kind of like adds to the conversation because like, yeah, this is, yeah. this is what's going on concurrently with this film. And I'm sure, uh, you know, Italian, uh, what was it? Italian neorealism? I think so. Yeah. Uh, uh, sounds right to me. I, I don't remember the exact title. I'm not, yeah. I, I'm a visual artist, not a film guy. You know, um, that, that, that was forced. Um, strong, I was going to say strong words for a uh, um, you know, movie podcast to sell it. Yeah. You know? I yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not really a film guy. <laughs> no, but, but I mean, I didn't study, you know, I, I mean, I've studied film. I, I, I took a class in sci-fi <laughs> films. But, Andy, didn't you bill yourself as Andrew movie guy world yeah, for a while? Yeah. Um, that's because <laughs> Forrest introduced me that with uh, Matthew film guy. And we we're trying right, to make a... Right. Uh, rivalry, but like that. Never- <laughs> that was like a, that was that was like a one. That was a Bambi versus Godzilla rivalry. To be clear, like there was no truly. <laughs> like I don't think Matthew even noticed. No. <laughs> anyway, he's like, "There's something yeah. on my foot." <laughs> well, only follows back one person on Twitter. Anyway, like you can't start shit with him because he, he sees it three days later. There you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it takes away the punch to it. But yeah, no, I mean, I think it's really interesting to, um, and I guess, yeah, Italian filmmaking would have done this too, like right after this uh, cataclysmic world event. And like indie filmmaking wasn't really a thing, you know, at this point. And they're kind of going right. through like a, a semi, um, like semi, uh, you know, I guess, I, I, I want to say regulated, but I don't think that's the word, like a, like a semi-official relationship with Selznick and, you know, a Hollywood studio, but, you know, not at the same time, like. This film has separate releases in the U.S., the U.K. Yeah, um, yeah it's definitely shot independently from Selznick and everything. And, yeah, and he was just he was just the money guy, and the speed guy. He had a lot of speed. No. <laughs> <laughs> they they go hand too. in hand. Yeah. <laughs> no, I the the reference that I'm making with that is uh, I have a Graham Green clip that I found, and he references the fact that he went in and Selznick was really speeded out and like. <laughs> And was giving them all these notes to a film that he's. We realized that, like, after giving them all the notes, that it was the wrong film. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. As one does. As one does. I mean, you know, producers are producers. You know, no matter what decade you're in. (laughs) Look, the important thing is to be authoritative. You don't even have to be correct about the subject. You just have to be authoritative. Whether your brain is whether your brain is gone with the wind, or uh, you know, whether it's still there. I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do think this is the the absolute, as do a lot of people feel that it, it is the quintessential like post war Vienna movie, right? Because it, mm. because of the timing. There. Getting back to the earlier point from about you know two hours ago, and <laughs> that it, it shows kind of the possibility of what can be, but also what was, and then what is at that time, which is like a subdivided city that's like you know multiple regions of which. Our protagonist is be a strong term uh, uh, <laughs> has taken advantage of, right? <laughs> Again, like we, we've Josh, we've taken to like you know uh, we, we did uh, um, Chinatown, and we, we you know ah. a, a certain former president would be like, it's just a guy trying to do a great deal, yeah, make a little money. <laughs> He's getting into the pharmaceutical business. He has a connect. 
He goes, he utilizes it. You know what? There's no regulations. There's no regulations. No one's all the haters the- trying to bring him down. You know, attacking his family. You can't attack someone's family. <laughs> uh, but yeah, in, in, in that same way. <laughs> that same way. That, that bit was so good. I wanted to re- redo it because I like, that was pretty good. Because <laughs> he would totally think that. Um, but Harry Lyme is, you know, he's taking hey. advantage of this event of, of like the, the the disorder and the chaos. Just right? working the deal, he's, man. He's and and deal. there was a lot of that, right? Like there yeah, really absolutely. was a lot of people that slipped into these cities. Inter- man, international man of mystery, I guess. That, you know, they slip into these cities. <laughs> as it said in the preview, yes. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> but there's also that in the dialogue as well, where everyone mentions, you know, as soon as as soon as the idea of any any sort of racketeering comes up, oh, we all do, we all must, because that's the chaos of this post-war economy that they're in is just you struggle to get by and harry just happens to be really good at it yeah it's like some people, somebody branding kind of, yeah <laughs> it from the very beginning some people are amateurs at it and don't last very long and kind of are just you know slipping into it some people are professionals and actually really are able to make a career out of being just like dystopic libertarian racketeers <laughs> <laughs> yeah right so, and and yeah. that's not a news story, but I think it's very well executed here because it does the thing where even though you don't even see Orson Welles until like the back half of the movie, like they spend the whole like first like, you know, half of it, like talking about it, mm-hmm. which, which, the, which, which, which is so great. <laughs> that's what makes it such a great role. He said it. They spend yeah. The whole yeah. First, yeah, front he, half of the movie talking it, about uh, you uh, you're in there for 15 minutes. He calls it a star role. He, he yeah. calls uh, that that kind of role. Um, he's like, oh, it's any kind of role that, like, you know, people talk about you for the first half of the movie. They're like, oh, where is he? And he, and he had uh, theatrical roles and or not theatrical play roles where he was, you know, on stage and people would say, oh, he's coming, he's coming, and then finally he would show up and you know the other half and everyone would be so excited because they're like, wow, who is this guy? Like, this guy must be a star. Yeah. Like, you mm-hmm. know, he's he's the subject of the play. And he said this is the cinematic kind of equivalent of that. Absolutely. Um, and, and every line is just like. Like, like, quotable, oh, so too. Just, yeah, just yeah, incredible. yeah. Um, well, just, we so, can so talk about the lines and his dialogue, but honestly, I think he the thing that he really brings to this movie, like, more than anything else, is uh, there's a Robert Mitchum quote, something about the, the tempo of film acting versus stage acting. And there's it's a perfect example of film acting that first shot of him, the light comes on. He, he barely moves oh. a muscle, but there's so much happening in his face. Yeah. And it just changes the whole direction of the movie. And really throughout the whole chase at the end, too. Like it's he doesn't he barely has he yells a couple things, but otherwise it's all in his face and all in his actions. And it's amazing. I mean, obviously it's amazing when he does have his speech. <laughs> well, but, and didn't I think uh, Peter Bogdanovich was talking about how like Orson Welles said like, all the best performances are all black and white because you don't yeah. have some things to distract you with, mm-hmm. right? And, and yeah, basically making his case in this film because yeah that reveal scene is like oh man that's like up there with like one of the all-time great like character reveals absolutely and just thrown uh, completely film. that bright against the black background it's so focused and you know the spotlit i also yeah. i i don't think i can think of very many movies that have a that consistent uh soundtrack the entire time and so like every time something dramatic happens, every time something dramatic happens, it's like I it's know, it's being scored the same way like a TV show is, right? Where um, <laughs> like he's able to go diddle 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 diddle, and then as it zooms in, so that happens a lot. Like there's that one moment where the guy's about to get murdered, and um the the porter, and oh the porter, he yeah, yeah. On his face, he turns around and then diddle diddle diddle. So like they're able to yeah. play with stuff like that. Um, and and I think that really makes the Orson Welles reveal. Like really amazing, mm, absolutely, and, and, and the fact that they they took that instrument and just bent it to like every like a conceivable way you can create yeah. like a, a motion out of it, um, you know, which a, which a master composer can certainly do. You know, I can imagine <laughs> somebody take like a didgeridoo and a rain stick and probably do, you know, <laughs> if, they, if they're a master of it. So that's good, yeah. <laughs> well, look at look at the Dead Man soundtrack, right? You know, like that. Uh, okay, Neil, Neil, Neil Young dropping a guitar for half an hour. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But it's so it's so perfect for for what it is. Right? Oh yeah, and and, and and it manages to like evoke emotion and with like a limited palette. It's a smaller box to work with. I was you like know, just except- reading about that. Sorry, brief tangent on the Dead Man soundtrack. Jim Jarmusch was being interviewed. And he talked about Neil Young did the soundtrack and he actually put some traffic noise in there. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, hilarious. Why did you 
put car noises in my western. It's, thought it sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> what a very Neil Young thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> like, and you can't get it on Spotify anymore. So, uh, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> uh, got, a, got a back copy. Wait for the box set to come back out. <laughs> Uh, you did we did you have a clip for Graham Green or we just want to talk about? Oh, I have the clip of him talking about it. I, okay. um, yeah, it's, Char- it's Charlie a, brought it up in the comments, is why I bring it up. So. Yeah, oh, cool. so this is this is Graham Green and uh talking about working with Carol Reed, they worked in collaboration. Um, Graham Green is obviously a, a pretty famous, um, uh, like war war writer, right? Like he was British intelligence for a really long time. Mm-hmm. He kind of has this very interesting backstory, um, that we can talk about. He kind of mentions it here, I think. Um, but he's also, you know, a great a great shit talker in the old British sense. So <laughs> I found this a, a fun clip. But there were various changes. And my, I had a dispute with Carol Reed over the end. Because I thought that people would be getting up to that long walk, you know, at the end. People would be getting up, taking their Macintoshes from under their seats and going out knowing that there'd be a happy ending or believing that it was going to be a conventional happy ending. But Carol Reed was right. He made a magnificent ending with the help of the music of the Zither. So it was a question of really a very close collaboration and, and yes. accepting some of his yes. ideas and presumably res- resisting some of yes. David Selznick's ideas as well, because he tried to interfere oh, a fair well, amount. Didn't yeah, he? We didn't accept any of his ideas. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, trouble was, the trouble was that um, on the terms of his contract with Corda, he was supplying Adida Vali and Joseph Cotton. And he had the right to, for discussions within six weeks before shooting. So Carol Reed and I had to go out to Hollywood and meet every night with Selznick. The first meeting didn't go very well because uh, he began by saying, but Graham, look, you're a writer, you know. You you can get a better title than The Third Man. Who's going to go and see a film called The Third Man? What do you want? You want something. I'm not a writer. I can't make sense. You're a writer, but something like Night in Vienna. And then he went on to say, um, and what's all this buggery, boys? What's all this buggery? I said, buggery? I said, look, chap goes out to find his friend. Doesn't find him. He's apparently dead. Why doesn't he go home? I said, said, well, look, he's been... He's got a motive of revenge. He's been assaulted by the British military police. He's fallen in love with a girl. Yes, but that's after that. Why didn't he go home before that? <laughs> but uh, our collaboration was on rather in those terms. And one terrible night towards the end, it was uh, getting on for midnight, and we had to go back to our hotel outside Hollywood. And he said, I can't understand, Graham, why you make Harry Lyme do something or other. I said, but he doesn't. He'd been chewing beds and dream to keep himself awake. He said, Christ, boys, that's another film. (laughs) (laughs) He complained afterwards. He sent pages of of criticisms and notes to uh, to Corda, but Corda put them in a drawer. And tell Carol not to mind. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. That's great. But I, I think that this uh, is something that I wanted to talk about with this movie. You know, the thing is that someone has to take assertive creative control. And you can tell that, you know, uh, someone like Graham Greene, who's a writer, who thinks of himself in terms of being a writer, right, um, thinks of a story in a certain way. And then Carol Reed obviously thinks of like the ending in a certain way, more in cinematic terms. And then you have someone like uh, Selznick, who's just an idiot on a bunch of speed. But like, you know, like, <laughs> but, but those are, but those are got Joe Cotton over there. But yeah, yeah. you got to have, you know, you got to have that idiot on speed to make a movie. It's, it's just it's a requirement. <laughs> well, look, every movie in the 80s, you know, it's the same thing with everybody doing blow on the table at every fucking. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an earlier version that now that like, you can only get in a, uh, you know, in an asthma inhaler. But, um, <laughs> we called it Canon Films. 
But so, no, I, I just think it's, it's, it's interesting that the story is a very different element than the um, direction, obviously. And then the production with the money is very different. And then you have talent like Orson Welles, who's his own, you know, who's just kind of wandering around Europe at this point. And they're like, hey, you want to come to, you know, Vienna to shoot this? Um, it's all things that could clash. Like they're all like if the wrong person, you know, had had decided something right. Like if uh, Graham Greene had decided the ending instead of Carol Reed, it would be a completely different movie. So mm -hmm. kind of that creative process, seeing that many like talented people, talented at one thing at least, um, kind of uh, co collaboratively working very well, I think, together is interesting. Oh, sure. I mean, which film is collaborative just by nature, and this is just I, – I see what you're saying is that the, it, it, the, it came together in the best possible way yeah. with the people that were involved. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah I can and, certainly see that. And – just the fact that you know there's a, a lot of kind of role switching within this right like he like carol reed is working very collaboratively with uh with graham green and mm -hmm. um orson wells kind of making up his own he made up that cuckoo clock uh part of the speech like right so they're kind of all putting things into this but like i don't know i just have always found it it might be because when i took when i took this noir class and that's the first time i saw this it was pointed out like oh there's so much talent here and they work very well so that might be why that's always been the first thing in my mind about this movie <laughs> Can, can can I just say that for a, a long time, uh, some time ago, I used to confuse Graham Norton and Graham Green. <laughs> <laughs> no English, biting wit. Sure, very, very different dudes. Different dudes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, not, I'm not proud of that. Not proud of that. But <laughs> but yeah, you know, like whatever. Like it's it's. I, I love the fact that um, they thought the third man was a bad title. It's a great title. Are you kidding yeah. me? That's a, that's it's like a timeless title. Yeah, and it's the crux of the, of the whole thing. Yeah. Not that you know it at the time, obviously, but, oh, the third man. I mean, yeah, without the third man, you don't have a story. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, in a way that, uh, you know, like sometimes there's been great titles where it's just like, you know, some um, almost <laughs> random nonsense or, <laughs> or something. Uh, and, and in this case, it's, it's intrinsic to the film, right? Yeah. It's intrinsic to understanding, like, what's happening and, like, why you should care about it. And I think that that's, you know... I mean, this goes to show you, like, you know, every once in a while, interference might be good. But for the most part, it's just people having their say. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or, you know, someone needs to be to. Uh, yeah. someone needs to be in control of, of situations. Right. right. Like there needs to be an authoritative voice. Like there needs to be the, the one person in creative control that says, like, hey, this is the way that it needs to be done. This is a movie. This is not uh, these, you know, conjoining roles, even if everyone's collaborating in a certain way. Um, yeah, there's that. There has to be one sort of choice maker within it. Even yeah, all the all the ideas are welcome, but usually usually that falls to the director. Occasionally, that's a producer, I suppose, or a writer. But that's typically the director's that you know role is to is to delegate and to be traffic cop. Yeah. All the By ideas. the way, I, I I like the fact that I mean, Carol Reed was an Orson Welles fan, so like the fact that he's like directing Orson Welles, who also happens to be a great <laughs> actor, but is like no joke as a director like and clearly like you know some of his uh some of carol reed stuff who by the way not not a woman just in case it wasn't. <laughs> yeah no, no english <laughs> actually totally well, a dude <laughs> you know he, he ended up being the uh authoritative voice in the room you know that's how you know yeah. in the 1940s that it was a Oh yes, man! Um, uh, but yeah, um, I I think it's also kind of fascinating. This movie feels like it has a lot of moving parts, not just uh, you know, you know. I, I think this is kind of um, both literal and me metaphorical because you know the city of Vienna is uh, divided into four parts, which mm -hmm. makes it an ideal spot for someone to be able to get away with this stuff because you just run into the next. You know, if somebody gives you safe haven, like the Russians in the United States are not very good friends at this point, although they seem to be. Uh, working collaboratively they're not exactly being like hey you want to come into the russian sector and try to solve a crime like no if you have a crime in the you know the u.s sector like you have to solve it within the u.s sector right but they're um, still working together to well, a like kind point. of barely you know what i mean like they, they like say against it their the, will yeah and but but also he has to bring uh he has to bring harry lyme to the u.s part of it um or, or the british part of it you know what I mean? Like he can't be like he's he's he has safe haven within the Russian part, but he's paying people off. So it's like, right? Yeah. But uh, I mean, it's still you know all the all the stuff with uh, <laughs> with uh, the you know the passport and the fake papers and everything. So they still work together on that stuff as well. Yeah. So there's still sort of a uh, you know the political 
Well, the Russians will come in there, around. you know, if they think that a, Czech, a, Czech, a woman from Czechoslovakia is hiding out in the American sector, they'll come in and say, hey, we need to like deport that woman, but they won't let you come in and, and try to get someone out of their sector, which is kind of a fascinating back and forth, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it just shows the dynamics of, well, either what's in the plot or what was the truth at the time. I don't necessarily know the difference. Yeah. Yeah, and it almost doesn't matter, right? Because it's sort of like it's like like this is like part thriller, part noir. There's a lot of like like thriller elements to it. And what 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 the things that makes a great thriller is not having all the answers for everything, as as Mm -hmm. for a great noir as well. And and the the fact that it is like such a chaotic environment and there's so many factors at play. uh, I think (laughs) I think that. um, (laughs) By the way, for people who only listen to this show, it must seem like we just like crack up at weird times. What's (laughs) happening is that comments are up on this. And we have very intelligent, very funny uh, people that are in the orbit of this show. So sometimes you'll just, you'll just, I try not to look when I'm sometimes they do the old Orson Welles. Sometimes they do the old Orson Welles and they say, you know, this is how I would do it. If I was on the show, this is what I'd be saying right now. Running their own show in the comment section. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it must be incredibly confusing to people only listen to the podcast. So I'm I'm, I'm just going to pull pull the curtain and show you that like that's what it is is that we're seeing like very funny comments Just anyway some, someone someone's made a face yeah exactly <laughs> someone's <laughs> exactly but i also so since we're talking so much about writers right I, like i love that like um he's he's a he like he's a mediocre writer like he's a hack writer yeah oh yeah this guy's not a good writer He's a hack writer yeah. within the, an entire subgenre of hack but, writing. Like, but that's, you know and I mean? that's a hack. Yeah. A hack is like someone that, like, you know, they 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 do work, but it's nothing exceptional. It's not even. It's come to mean like insulting. It's come to mean like you know it, bad in some way. But it, yeah. it's really just it's passably mediocre. Is like what hack. But but what I'm saying yeah, is can... what I'm saying is it's a disrespected genre, right? Like Western right, right. books, like they're not. Oh yes, it's very strongly put down. I mean, there's that right. whole discussion scene. Where he's trying, he's trying to lead this literary thing, and and everybody's walking out, and no one gives a shit. Yeah, <laughs> we just don't care about this. Well, Tell the Benedict Cumberbund. He's, they seem, they seem to think he's almost joking when he says, "Oh, I write westerns." At the beginning, the guy's like, "Oh, I'm sure right. this guy, like rushes it off." Yeah. And it's like, "No, <laughs> westerns." This guy like, is a oh really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Although it's based around the fact that the one guy has read his books, and yeah, yes, Sergeant Finn. Most... No, yeah. Sergeant that's not his no. real name. That's the that's the name of the character yeah. from Doctor Who. Ah, uh, uh, but yes, the the real hero of the movie. Uh, I think it's <laughs> like sets uh, everything in motion in a, in a way. Kyle or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just called him the Sergeant Benton of the Brigadier because because uh, those two characters very oh, much. Pines. Reminded me. His name is like Sergeant Pines. Pines. Yeah. But, okay. they, but they reminded me of those characters from uh, the third uh, the third incarnation of the Doctor when he was stranded yeah. on Earth and working yeah. with Unit. And uh, you know, unlike uh, unlike Doctor Who, these sets are gorgeous. Um, you know, and, and really, I mean, it's not really. What do you mean? You don't set. like quarries? <laughs> <laughs> so well, the quarries were great. Quarry. It's just you know, all everything else looked like was going to fall over at any look, minute. Look, look, look. You, you you seem very intent on on diverting us to talk about Doctor Who. So let me just say that what I love about some of those episodes is I think about it as like the greatest game of Let's Pretend ever. Right, because oh, yeah, the yeah. special effects are absolutely not there, but the no. stories and writing generally are absolutely. It's just that they're but, making but the best of what they have. The thing is, though, is is that, that those two characters I think were like uh, more or less prototypes for what uh, Doctor yeah. Who uh, did later, which which you know obviously this movie's borrowed from heavily, you know, from everything from Doctor Who to SpongeBob. So you know, it's very influential. Yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah. So I I think that <laughs> she, he he managed the crowbar. Sp- the, the the thing I said we weren't going to mention that I banned from all letterbox one liners by the way oh <laughs> <laughs> well that's fair that's your, only, that's your they only know one show they only know one show and and it's not even a clever wrong. comment it's just like they they re- hey blah. I'm like that's not funny oh. what's funny no I mean it's just they game? are using the same music that's it that's that's it's, it it's, that's the joke it's that's, the same, yeah it's the same instrument I mean it's like, just that's no 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 it actually is the same bit uh believe me you know I got little kids I thought watch spongebob way more than it's the internet conan it's the internet <laughs> you, you find both the highest common denominator and the lowest con- common denominator just you know living it up as if as if you're in post-war vienna oh yes absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but if we're talking about the, uh, the 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 set and the look of the movie let's spend let's some time on that because that, yes. <laughs> it's amazing it's 
wonderfully everything you know it looks constantly just a little wet because they're yeah. apparently they're actually like spraying down the cobblestones just so you get the reflective uh and the lights are reflecting off of that the lights are are yeah. making shadows you know uh building size and everything it changes your perspective back and forth and it's wonderful how it's just it's it's very contrasty to the blacks and whites are very set apart there's not a lot of grayscale scale in the movie and um it really yeah. it really it really highlights it, it 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 subtly you know shows you where you should be looking without without being just like too spotlighty unless it really means to be obviously like like harry lime's first introduction but apart from that you know it's 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 very good at directing your eye and pointing you at you know looking at this you know look over here look at this dog look at the you know and that it's it's i i don't I think every movie that I've seen that is like that is definitely coming off the influence of that. Like I never saw anything that yeah. like I could point to and say, Oh, that influenced the third man. It seems like it comes from that. Well, and it helps with the atmospheric tension a mm -hmm. lot too, because it's like the, all that use of shadows, it gives you the feeling that they like, could be like anything could be around the corner. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and usually and, is. And generally yeah. is. Yeah, and yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it's different. just a parrot, but other times, whatever. <laughs> <they're doing. laughs> yeah. And I mean, like, like you know, the, the influence of this is just, it's not felt in just uh, on screen too, because like, you know, looking at like Barry Craigson's work, um, uh, his, his uh, comic, uh, The Master Race, which is an absolute masterpiece in, in comic book storytelling. Um, it, it, it sure. you know, you can actually see like some of the fingerprints of, of like, uh, the, you know the the shadow the lights and everything like that and, and hmm. just so much that that he put into the uh those eight pages uh, to tell one of the greatest comic stories ever written all right and he's really into the stuff about the master race apparently um <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna break it up i was like I'm, I'm but I like about this okay and so, so, so if you need to know it's about a, a survivor <laughs> of the nazis who finds a nazi uh on the subway and uh, the whole uh, the happens. guy freaks out. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's you seem determined to talk about anything but this movie right now. I, I'm starting it, to it, wonder it, if, but, but I just want to point if it out if, like, if you even watched whatever. it. Whatever, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a classic, like, like I'm making reference to like literary masterworks here, and you get Pointing distracted yeah. because of the, the children, the Come children on. of this. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's but, got his own, he's got his own private, he's gonna be like Ravana when she jumped in and had that whole other show going in the corner. Yeah, What's she had her show. That's what Andy's got going on right now, <laughs> except for it's for himself. But I, yeah. I want to go back to a comment that I think uh, you made, Conan, when you said it's kind of like a, a thriller and a noir at the same time. Yeah. The movie's subdivided into, you know, much like, uh, you know, Vienna's subdivided, the movie's subdivided into two parts, right? There's the mm -hmm. first half before he um, realizes that Lime is still alive, where he, he thinks of himself um, almost as this, like, weird self-referential, like, uh, you know, detective character, right? Like, he doesn't... Right, he's, he's the sheriff. Yeah. yeah, and he's kind of I'm bumbling his way through something that, like, he really should not be bumbling his way through. Clearly, everyone <laughs> is telling him, like, everyone is like, dude, you don't want to go down this path. Things are yeah. good. Everything is fine. Go home. And he's like, yeah. no, Harry would, would, want me, would want me to solve the mystery of his death, you know, and, and to yeah. the, I don't know what he thinks is going to happen when he does, you know, uh, inevitably, you know, find whoever killed Harry. Like, he, he, he doesn't have a plan. And, you know, that is one of the things that when uh, they're talking about Graham Greene and uh, what, like that conversation, he's like, why does he stay there? Well, they keep inventing reasons for him to stay there. Like, he's ready yeah. to leave multiple times. That's what's kind of amazing about this movie. He's like, I guess I'm just going home. And then, you know, you, you think like, okay, maybe he really is going to go home this time, uh, the first time you watch it or something. And then something happens, and then he, like, has to run out of the room, and he has to come up with another reason to stay. Right. Um, yeah, and he's – and that's another – uh nor trademark thing isn't he? he's just basically a character who's too curious for his own good yeah right and just this movie kind of yeah. takes it like this movie kind of feels like it ramps it up like there's no reason that he should be uh staying around for that right like th like because sometimes <laughs> yeah. you're like well this is uh like chinatown's a perfect example like he has to solve it because he's like listen people are gonna think that i'm shit at my job and they're not gonna come actually like work for me i got hired to do something i'm gonna you know i'm gonna figure it out well, see it through. Yeah. yeah, yes, to a point, but I think I think the movie does a real good job of establishing that he has nothing set. Like, if he goes home, there's nothing there for him anyway. Yeah, he's broke as hell. <laughs> yeah, so he might as well just hang around and see if he can figure out this this mystery because there's nothing motivating him to do anything else apart from it's where he lives. Yeah, and, and I, I like, do like that. that yeah, oh, I was gonna say I do like that. That producer's note was, "Doesn't just go home." <laughs> that's, that's an incredible producer because there wouldn't be a movie moron there would not be a movie of any kind if he just went home 
That's why it doesn't go home, you fucking idiot. The producer's note was actually. <laughs> Yeah. Why isn't he doing it? Listen, 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 yeah. And you know, and I know people dislike it when I put it this way, but that's why we often say, well, often say I'm best of the worst is because movie. Yeah, because, <laughs> because movie. literally, if it doesn't happen, there is no movie, and you have to you have to have a movie. Something has to happen. <laughs> so, but they kind of say it really. Well. I, I think yeah. I interrupted Andy talking about some completely unrelated topic. So, no, Andy, I was just going to compare him to like a, an inept Columbo. Columbo bumbles through it purposefully, like like to disarm yeah. people. This yeah, guy's yeah. just bumbling <laughs> through it, not having any plan, and somehow also disarming people the same way Columbo does. Yeah, yeah, and, and there yeah people really talk a... to him because yeah, he's yeah. just some random American. They feel like they just can some guy. They, there's who's he going to talk to? Turns out everybody, yeah. but they don't necessarily <laughs> realize it at the time. Yeah, this guy writes westerns. He's no threat. Yeah, but the other thing is that they keep dropping him clues like by accident throughout the whole thing, right? Like the Baron is yeah. like, well, you know, this this girl was there, I guess, uh, and gives him the name of where the girl. He could just be like, no, like you should just shut the guy down. So then he well, goes he, there, and, and he, he immediately realizes his down. mistake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that scene is just like, uh, oh, uh, uh, that the theater. <laughs> he's already realized he's fucked up, and he's just like, oh, ah, yeah. oh, shit. All right. <laughs> And they, they like kind of have their story straight, but like not exactly. You know, well, I mean the porter at least they don't bother to threaten the, the porter ahead of time. You know what I mean? It's so, like all four of them kind of have some kind of story that's straight, but they like kind of lack information. I like when they talk to the doctor. And he's like, "How would I know whether he was murdered? The injuries would have been the same." I think that's a brilliant line. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> well, yeah, and everybody's trying to look yeah. out for the porter as well. Like his wife has said, "Don't talk to that guy. Don't talk to anybody about this shit." But the porter's, you know, just. Innocent. <laughs> and, oh, I don't care. You know, there was a third man. <laughs> <laughs> I also really like uh, the Baron before we get into like, you know, other characters with this movie. I like when the Baron says, uh, he doesn't just say, oh, well, we all kind of do this, uh, you know, this kind of stuff. He's like, one time I sold tires and I was thinking, <laughs> what would my dad have thought about me in that moment? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 tires. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, because it's, it's a class thing at that point, right? Like, uh, once they were these great, powerful, like, nobles mm -hmm. or something, and now he's selling tires off the road. I just think that's well, yeah, he has to, yeah, he has to play violin in the restaurant to make a living. Yeah. You know, he's reduced Apparently to... They all hang out at. That's how they all met. They were all... And everyone all... knows the real money's in the zither. That's right. Need <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a couple extra courses on that. Uh, put some frets on that thing, man. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I kind of... Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of fascinating characters within this. And we talked about this with, uh, you know, with Aline the other day, right? Like the the amount of actually just fascinating one-off characters. I feel like this, yeah. this movie kind of takes a lot of the noir tropes that we've been kind of discussing and like ramps them up to an insane level. Like number one, of course, there's the, you know, the, the Dutch angles, which kind of Ooh. all noir movies have. <laughs> Um, yeah. to some degree or another, but this movie kind of just goes, you know what, let's just go da -da 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 -da, and like literally just zoom in and do like, you know, all that stuff. The silhouettes yeah. are so beautiful throughout the movie. Yeah. Like they, they and that, the yeah, it all works. It yeah. all works as a disorientating, you know, you're, you're, you're not sure what, where you're looking and, and what's, you know, everything's a little off or a lot off. Yeah. And the, so they pick the, uh, the, the actor that plays the Baron first is like, you know, literally looks like a vulture. Like, <laughs> as as we said earlier on, like he's this strange looking man, and uh, so is the doctor, right? The doctor. Uh, he looks like an evil potato. Yeah, <laughs> and and I like that they keep doing these bits throughout the entire movie. Um, first with uh, Callaway, or he says, "Listen, Callahan," and he says it multiple times, and the guy says, "I'm not Irish." I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's. And I, they do it with uh, the doctor too. He says, uh, "Doctor Winkle," and he says, "Winkle." Because he's bumbling his way into this into this uh, incredibly complicated multi like multi uh, ethnic and multi dimensional um, you know city mm -hmm. at a time when the city's kind of at its most um, you know when you don't want to be bumbling your way into multiple quarters of a post war city yeah, like completely <laughs> completely being the American tourist yeah right <laughs> and, and there's a lot of history and everything's clashing all at once I mean I think one of the key it isn't applied for that specifically but one of the key lines in this is when Anna's like a person doesn't change just because you find out more hmm. yeah. like I think that 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 holds true not just for like you know the the main characters but you know, all the different various organizations and governments and and, and yeah. operators and everybody's motivations is like even just because you found out something about them doesn't mean that their motivations have changed and i think that that's uh that's that's one of the all for me that's one of the all-time great noir lines too 
and, yeah. and throughout this movie, they kind of he drops hints, right? That his friendship with Harry Lime, you know, he taught him uh, three card Monty or whatever at 14 years old. Like this guy was a, a, a very proud a of him. Yeah. You know, like a, yeah, he knew how to like get a, out of like tests. Little con artist, right? Like yeah, he's a little con artist from the from the moment that he's you know as young as he is. And um, and then he says later, like, oh well, I had to escape from the casino and you got out okay, but I didn't when it got raided. Like, there's a bunch of times where he drops these hints that like the relationship between him and Harry Lime has always been he kind of bumbles into the situation. They're just friends and he wants to cut him in. So it's kind of fascinating that like, he's so surprised that like Harry Lyme could have done this thing. That's so heinous. And it really is like selling, um, you know, selling antibiotics that are diluted and actually like, end up killing. Up. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, was, you, know, um, you know, whenever they said they diluted it, I just had flashbacks to every single, like, you know, drug empire movie I've ever watched where it's like, <laughs> you know, talking about like stepping on, you know, your, your uh, heroin or whatever. Man, this yeah, is yeah. the, this is the purest, this is the purest antibiotics we've ever, we've ever sold. I, I yes. promise. We've got, we've got to put some baby aspirin in that penicillin, man. <laughs> <laughs> we, get, we get that Peruvian cut too, in it, man. Too pure. <laughs> but actually I do, I do like the way that the movie really kind of brings that, you know, sets that in really hard. I mean, again, just because of because of Holly being such a fool, he shows up when Anna's supposed to leave the first time and fucks that all up. But then he's like, nah, fuck it, I'm not doing it again. And they get all that back and forth. And they when they take him, when Callaway takes him, you know, into the into the ward to see the children and the actual physical effects, you know, really drives that home. Because yeah. you could, if you were being a stickler and you wanted to cut it down for some reason, you could kind of take that beat out. But I like how strongly it really like he goes how much he waffles back and forth and then it takes well, he manipulates him, to the last... him too he goes i yeah. want to get out of here let me get on the plane there's finally somebody wants him to stay and he's like nah i think i'm gonna you know yeah not right. really <laughs> right yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah he's like he's like oh we just have to make a stop really fast and they stop and it's the hospital and he has to see the kids and how truly disfigured that they actually yeah. are and, yeah and uh, it takes it takes him that much to really finally decide to betray harry yeah and I, I, it's kind of one thing that I think is fascinating is obviously Anna is such a, like a good, she seems like a very good person. She's incredibly loyal throughout yeah. this movie. Mm. He's not loyal whatsoever, but you know, he still, <laughs> he still doesn't really want to betray uh, whatever friendship he has with Harry Lyme. And so you barely really see him. And you have to put the details of that relationship uh, that they're all having kind of, um, yeah. you, know, you have to like piece it together in your own head uh, because you don't really find out that much about, you know, he gets his one big speech and, you know, he gets a, uh, I mean, you see him a few times, but like, it's not like you, you really know that much about Harry Lyon besides what everybody's kind of saying about him. Right. Well, and then ostensibly they're, they're buddies, but like, he seems to be okay with like, sort of like falling in love with his girlfriend too. Well, he said that, that uh, Harry yeah. stole his girl way back when, and now he's going to do the same to him. That's true. Well, and also keep in mind during the first part of the falling in love, he thinks Harry's dead. Right. <laughs> That, so that that's, by the time he finds out, he's really he's made you know he's made commitments. He's like, I'm into this. <laughs> I'm not going to waffle back and forth on this one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. But but so 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 I wanted yeah, to I wanted yeah, to break yeah. down the movie. Uh, I wanted to break down the movie um, into those two parts, right? So there's the first part that's kind of the thriller when he thinks that um, he's dead, and then there's the second part that really you know once you see Orson Welles, it turns into a very different movie. He's no longer trying to uh, – it's no longer a movie where he's trying to solve the mystery. The mystery is solved. He's alive. Someone else is dead. But he has to decide whether or not to betray his friend. I think that's kind of fascinating because those are two very different stories, and I think the stakes to them are very different. It's yeah. a moral quandary, too. Like, it turns into a moral quandary rather than, like, you mm -hmm. know, curiosity. And, and, like, sort of like, well, what – you know, it's very easy to turn a blind eye. Like, well, that's a Terry Lyme stuff. He's running around doing this. And then, then it's like, Oh, well, hold on a second. This has like material uh, detriment to basically the war torn city. And yeah. a, lot, a lot of people yeah. that don't deserve that. And then, and like, should there be culpability? Should there not be? It's a, I mean, that's classic noir, right? And probably some people that do deserve it, but you know, it's mm -hmm. Austria after the war. <laughs> Uh, that, <laughs> I'm completely kidding. <laughs> well, when Andrew was reading The Master Race, he thinks that he's, <laughs> <laughs> when he's doing the offering, it's really fucked up. Oh, <laughs> I mean, like, oh, like, but, 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 all right, but, but real talk. I mean, they're kids, right? Yeah. Like, when they, like this, this, this scene that we're you're just talking about. But, you know, about. I would go yeah. back in time and kill baby Hitler, so. <laughs> exactly. As long as we go back and run that, it's very important. Uh, <laughs> but I do want to actually point out, though, that it, 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 it changes as well because it changes it morally because the the uh, <laughs> I'm here. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> um 
<laughs> because because Holly does know beforehand, before he knows that Harry's alive, that he's you know he's been doing all this, and he but 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 he doesn't necessarily he he, he kind of yeah just brushes it off as as typical chicanery, just what he's doing to get by. And then yeah, once once he realizes that Harry is alive, it takes on a completely different bent, and he has to, he realizes that not only has you know he's Harry's going to keep doing this as well. So there is that moral incentive, moral incentive for him to stop it one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how to address that. Watch on YouTube, I guess. I don't I don't know. Know. <laughs> but yeah, uh, um, use an ad block. I like the word uh, chicanery that you threw in there, by the way. That's a good word. <laughs> uh, well, and I, and I think, so the cinematography and the direction for this, I think uh, also puts all these quandaries in a like a visual spectrum like you, you get to see like yeah. you know the world be like upended in, in such a way and you know mm -hmm. and, and the different the differences of light and shadow are like you know happening like all the time and that's something like andy's this is normally andy's stuff normally he's the one that like talks about this kind of thing but it, it's really pronounced here it's but very like bold. subtle and in, in it in, in, in when it needs to be but like very unsubtle when it when it needs to be as well yeah. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's kind of like influential from a like a visual perspective uh, for for a lot of films, especially films of, of the noir genre, because it's it's trying to externalize, you know, these complicated uh, moral failings and uh, and um, scenarios that, that the characters mm -hmm. go through. Well, and uh, from, from a practical point of view as well, keeping a set dark is always going to be cheaper than trying to. Decorated, and let <laughs> <Right>. it <pop>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you also have It's not as much a set as like you're just kind of going out and shooting within that. Yeah, city. Like, I, I think it was uh, Tim Pope who directed uh, the second Crow movie, which is not a good film. The the release, um, mm -hmm. but oh, but they did uh, make a second if, one, didn't they? Oof. Yeah, well, they made like five of those. Conan. They, they made a whole bunch. Really? Of them. But the thing is, oh, though, the, the one thing to, to talk about the second one about is that the director didn't want to just copy the first one. Uh, and there's he actually made a much better film that it got released. Uh, so you know, released the uh, Pope Cut uh, hashtag. Mm. Um, but, but, is, yeah. is, is it like as different as Highlander too? Let's not. Uh, talk no, about no. But but he, one, he, <laughs> one of the things he was trying to do was instead of having everything rainy, where the, you know the rain, the wet, uh, oh, yeah. Could get, yeah, picked up the lights. He had broken glass everywhere. Oh uh, God! To kind of create the effect, which which uh, makes the movie absolutely beautiful. Everything's like orange and foggy, hmm. and has broken glass all over the ground, and and it looks amazing. Um, just, just on a strictly visual level, the yeah, only just, way to appreciate that movie. Shame about the non-visual <laughs> elements of it, I'm sure. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but but anyways, uh, and so like you know, uh, this movie obviously, yeah, they, they, you know, they talk about them wetting down the cobblestone to to have yeah. that light be picked up because you need a little bit of that because if it's just black, it's going to be flat. Absolutely. Um, you know, you know, just just like how black's very slimming on you, um, you know, because because there's no definition to it, which is you know why Conan looks like he has this flat black. Uh, space in the middle of his chest right now. Um, <laughs> the void where his heart should be. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all you see is, is, is cicada bolo tie, and that's it. Yeah. That's all you um, see. So, so this is. I, I have a clip of. Um, I have a clip talking about the undercover uh, sewer cops, which are a real thing. Apparently, there was a, a bunch of undercover oh, cops. It, undercover sewer cop is the word you yeah. said. Okay. <laughs> so, so you know, I mean, the final scene of this movie, they're obviously running through the sewer. Yeah. It took um, like four weeks to film that, right? I mean, they were running around there for forever. Mm -hmm. So it, it's apparently a real thing that was happening in Vienna at the time, where people were hiding in the sewers to commit crimes, and uh, oh, they were, yeah. So they were, so they were using the sewers. So they, they had an entire uh, type of cop called a sewer cop that would go undercover and run through the sewers. Wow! And, and all sewer cops amazing. are bastards too. Yeah, a <laughs> cab, a cab includes sewer cops. A S C A B. Yeah. <laughs> ASCAP. Yeah. We don't expect to find criminals in our sewers, but they do in Vienna. To fight this pest, a special canal brigade, as they're called, has been formed. Addressed as ordinary sewermen, these underground police are taken to various manholes, which they enter and start their watery and weird patrol. <laughs> the great network of sewers is patrolled almost like the streets above. 
In conjunction with the Vienna Police Department, we were able to take these extraordinary pictures. And as the torches fixed on the policemen's rifles and threw their searching lights, the world above was forgotten in this strange beat. Sometimes the going is comparatively easy, though it could never be called pleasant. But often the narrow canals made progress very uncomfortable. This underworld has its regular visitors besides sewermen and police. Tramps are sometimes found searching for the many small articles and coins that are lost down the drains. But everyone is searched, and all being well, they are allowed to proceed with their very exclusive occupations. <laughs> A swiftly flowing river, as well as canals, runs under the city, and its gloominess makes a modern Styx. There are strange jobs in this world, but surely none so weird as that of these police of the underworld. Mm. How about that? I so Graham Greene said that uh, by he, he heard about that kind of thing going on, and that's kind of one of the things that inspired his script or like his idea for this was the idea that they could have people running through the sewers. Um, I want to be a sewer cop detective, not a sewer cop beat cop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the paperwork. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the paperwork, and then sometimes you get something on it from your sewer clothes, and you know what? It's just a, it's a whole mess. Oh. Yeah, and, and you know the detectives, like they get all the fame and fortune, you know, truly in the sewer. And literally, yeah, literally, literally <laughs> fame and fortune is, you know, sometimes people drop a bunch of money into the sewer and, uh, you know, they're the ones exactly. who find it. So there you go. <laughs> um, but yeah, we should, I mean, it, the, 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 that setting with the, with the water flowing on the, on the, on the ground definitely d does the same thing that the cobblestones do. Yeah. Where it gives you that, like that reflection and that motion there. And then of course you've got these giant halls with the lights at the end. So you get the same effect with the, with the, you know, the, the figures being, you know, uh, you know, 50 feet tall. So it definitely it's interesting that 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 the sewers mirror the overground setting in that yeah. way. And and there's I mean you kind of see that within um the scene where you know they're they're in the square and I used it for this intro. Um you know they're in the they're in the city square and they're running around and Orson Welles disappears. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um you know he's showing he's showing uh Callaway, not Callahan, that's a different guy, but <laughs> he's showing uh he's showing Callaway through the uh the Such situation. casual disgust that is said too. I, I yeah. love the casual. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like only a British person, only a British person would <laughs> oh. uh, think to include that. You know what I mean? Like, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or my grandmother, because you know she really hates those Irish. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but so he's going through the square, and and the guy doesn't. You know, Callaway doesn't believe him. He thinks he's you know uh, fucking with him again, or not fucking with him, but you know just. Or at least of, drunk. Yeah. Because he, he keeps feeding him alcohol, though he seems to think he's also an alcoholic, which is a weird. <laughs> Right. He's like, you need a drink. He's like, no, 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 I'm good. And he's like, oh, you fucking alcoholic drinking that German gin. It's like, not him again. <laughs> like, whoa, um, can't win with you. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so he leads him through the square, and and suddenly, you know, it dawns on him, and he looks inside the thing, and then you see the rushing water, and he's like, oh fuck, he escaped into the sewer. Like, yeah, that's real. But as someone that you that doesn't know that part of uh, the city, right, or as someone that doesn't know that like cr like criminals were regularly, you know, disappearing to the sewer, it's kind of like a moment that's like, huh. You know, like he's kind of a genius for that, but like, yeah. but it kind of um, has a whole different, I think, notion to it when you realize that everybody was kind of using the sewers that way. Yeah, those spiral staircases just make it so tempting. You know, you just want to go to Vienna and do crime and, and <laughs> disappear down just a spiral those, staircase into the sewer. Those pie shaped manhole covers, just pop those yeah. up. And, oh, yeah. Looks like a <laughs> Here cinch. you go. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles never had it so easy. No. <laughs> no, we got to lift up heavy. Ugh. Yeah. That, that's horrible. <laughs> it's also a time when you know if you don't have papers which i'm guessing a lot of people that are kind of in there illegally don't have papers you know you can kind of use that as a transportation uh area to get from any point to another point if so you, yeah if you know yeah. if you know the sewer system it's like a back door throughout the entire city yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i i don't know i think it's interesting to like uh have think about graham green kind of getting the idea like oh fuck like what if we had someone run through the sewers at the end of it and uh, that's kind of how he gets away. <laughs> oh God! And you get that amazing shot of his fingers up through the grates. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, just that, that, end that was, struggle. First, first time I saw it, I was very tripped out by like the uh, how, how they get into the sewer. I'm like, what is that? That looks like some like sci-fi stuff. Like, what is that? But like that, that's yeah, they didn't even do that on Doctor Who when when uh, <laughs> they were fighting Eddie's like, in the sewer. You'd be like, I can climb down there, expect to see Davros hanging up. But here yeah. we <laughs> I, I don't know, but I think it's kind of almost like a, 
it's interesting to realize that something's like a regular thing rather than kind of um, something that they like, kind of got thought of on the fly, right? Like, let's yeah. fix this. Let's figure out how we can get through the city. And it's like, no, this is something that like actually inspired the actual story. Yeah, there's, yeah. There was some crazy amount of tunnels under uh, uh, sewer tunnels under Vienna, right? Like it's it's and there's mm-hmm. even more now. But like at the time, there was like some insane amount of like you know, like just well, there's a river. The river has to get through everything. And right. the, as they said in this, and the, the river literally runs it. through it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right, folks? Am I right? Oh. You're trying to night. Sign the petition. <laughs> oh, but this economy, let me tell you. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we get some cutbacks. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yes. But but the, the fact that the people would actually uh, apparently look for loose change in the sewers. Because they're that poor, right? Like, like yeah, they're the, that poor. People are that crushed by this uh this economy, you know, this post that economy. Hey, yeah. that economy. Yeah, cool. and those spiral staircases make it really much easier as opposed to like you know those those ladders that we have that that are like mm-hmm. you know uh just rebar uh, into concrete. If you yes. could cut on one of those, you might get shot. And <laughs> and and I think that also uh Berlin gets a lot of attention as like the you know the post-war city, right? Like that's the most sure. famous of the. And I, you don't really think about Vienna that much, and like what was happening in other cities that might not have been uh, the center Which, of the action. My grandfather was stationed in after the World War, uh, after World War Two. He lied about his age, went there at sixteen, and and uh, was part of the uh, the transition uh, yeah. at, through Germany. Yeah. So, that's, uh, uh, my 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 grandpa stayed in Berlin after the war, and that's how that's how we met my grandma, and how I ended up down the line, you know, coming into the world. So, <laughs> yeah, <There you go. laughs> um, yeah, I so. I guess uh, time travelers, the one to do these guys wrong, take note. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Head on over. But yeah, you're, it's, 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 I'm not going to tell you a damn thing about where I'm from. <laughs> it is honestly overlooked to a point where I was telling somebody about this movie that hadn't seen it. And I said Berlin instead of Vienna because I just blanked. Yeah. It, it seems like, yeah, culturally, like that's what we're sort of like, like that's what we think of when, mm-hmm. when we, when we mm-hmm. think of especially a post divided city. Divided city, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And and the reason that we think of it that way is because that's literally where the boundary line was between the Soviet yeah. Union and the United States, which isn't right. the case in Austria. But like, still, you can see it is divided into those four quadrants. And uh, yeah, all kind of hijinks, hijinks ensue. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, which is a far better preview than the actual preview for the movie. Hijinks um, ensue. <laughs> 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 Smell like a man. You tried smelling like the first man. You tried smelling like the second man. Now try. Oh, do toilet. The third, the third man. <laughs> what, what, what is this? The, feel, Hun- the touch of the Vienna sewers. <laughs> what is it? Hunted by a thousand men. Haunted by a lovely girl. Like, what? Oh, desired by just one woman. Yeah. <laughs> Like desired what? by one woman, but feared by thousands of men. I yeah, just, <laughs> like, those are men with gangrene. Those are the, those are the men that fear him. <laughs> I was like, honestly, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> thousands so of they men they were going to give you antibiotics, is what they were afraid of. <laughs> oh, <laughs> those thousands of men fear one, one, the one woman. Gets you? really bad. And... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I have a cut. God damn it! I hope there's no third man. So, 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 that, that seems like taglines written by someone who has not, in fact, seen the film. Is what it seems like. Oh yeah. god, yeah. You know, yeah. Maybe cool. maybe got to see the assemblage of footage that they gave him for the. Trailer. I get it. I got this. <laughs> the woman loves him. The cops are after him. He's the bad guy, him. but he's the good guy. Yeah, 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 there's yeah. three of them. There's the third man. <laughs> there you go. Who was called the? Th- who are the other? I don't. I don't care. I don't care. The third man. They call him the third man. <laughs> People and, are and talking like, about him. People are talking about him more and more. And more. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Every day I hear more about this third man. <laughs> but it's like maybe like they just show the guy who makes the taglines like the the sewer chase and like you know the you know, the like pretty lady cry. Scene. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's it. That's, oh, I, I, that's all you get to see. Yeah, <laughs> a sewer chase and the pretty lady crying. Oh, I could put this together in my head. Yeah. I know. I know. I've seen <laughs> it a million times. <laughs> it, it, it's like those incredible posters, <laughs> movie posters that are made. I think they're a uh, gaunt. Uh, Ghanaian artists oh, that like yeah. where, where they have no frame of they've never seen the film they have, the only frame of reference they have is usually like whatever's on like the the VHS cover and then like you get these like just crazy like you know it's like Home Alone but like Kevin Malone's got like a beheaded 
Steve's head. And like, like we're like, what on earth did you, how did you come up with this? And they're incredible. Fire right? and blood and yeah. And everybody's like, like craziness. Armed and like have machetes and like and it's, like it's, I it's, wish the movie was that exciting. God yeah, damn. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna see Home Alone again. I want Andy to do it to go into the episode art that way and just like, <laughs> just <laughs> Play it up. <laughs> yeah, just, just do it right on the title, you know. I, I can have fun like that. Um, <laughs> I see. I see three men. There's. There's one of them is a third man. I don't know. I'll. I'll, I'll figure something out. <laughs> Let me see if I can find guns. Find three guns men and a baby. <laughs> this is, oh my god on, i'm gonna show you one this is amazing uh okay so uh, and and look I, I i don't want there to be too much nonsense but a little nonsense is uh helps the medicine go down right uh so uh, here's mrs is that, is here's that mrs doubtfire yeah, yeah oh, i was this, gonna say it's a little doing... medicine without... oh my god <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Uh maybe uh I think let's see. Y- y'all probably have uh let's see. You probably have seen not slides. I'm doing this. Horrible grandfather or whatever, by the way. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Like, I gotta I wanna spend more time with my blind kid. <laughs> 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 this, this is this is maybe more for uh, um, after party stuff, but yeah, let's see. Here's here's one for Space Jam. Um, oh, well, why is it why is it oh, so small? Tiny. But uh, yeah, there's there's a there's a <laughs> he's armed. He's, gun, he's armed. A... He's armed. You know, um, Space Jam armed and dangerous. Oh man, some sort of <laughs> female <laughs> rodent animal with it <laughs> yeah exactly you blocked me on twitter this week who did no there's a there's a there's an account that's just a squirrel like a loony or a disney squirrel that okay that blocks every yeah never mind okay. who can forgive this classic scene from that, et there you go <laughs> <laughs> what's going on here is that michael jackson it is yes, michael it is. jackson yes, yes it, it is, is. Yes, <laughs> Like the face logger is one thing, but Michael Jackson in ET. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I, I guess there you go. It really, it really does. I guess the delayed action. See what the fire, the fire got in there too. There's just flames. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just yeah, as you I, do. I, I uh, got to meet the Hildebrands a while ago. Well, I, one of them, I can't remember which brother it was, but uh, they painted this uh, the original Star Wars poster. And, oh, nice. Uh, but they were told uh, if you've ever seen it, it looks nothing like any of the characters, and and they're yeah. like. Um, uh, do, do you want to send us any photos so we can get a uh, likeness of the the actors? And, and the uh, studio goes, nobody knows what the actors look like anyway, so just just paint uh, whoever. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so so they got sure. their neighbors in bathrobes, <laughs> and that's really what it looks like. Just some rich people in bathrobes posing, but <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's 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 <laughs> a great poster, but like you know, because it, it, that composition um is is just rock solid and got reused. Uh, uh, by by better painters um uh later on <laughs> but, oh know, yeah, it's, really, yeah. It's, just, it's it's amazing because like like it's just like that's not luke skywalker <laughs> who is that <laughs> anyway th- this is absolutely it's after party guy. business and i'm and I, yeah I, i'm sorry it slash is, not sorry after party content you. um yeah, so if you, you, so if, you the... so if you are interested in yeah. this type of nonsense and not a serious discussion about the exxon move the third man uh hang out for the after party uh if you join as a pat- patron patreon patreon for uh, oh my god patreon. Uh, well, this is why I usually use the pitches. Well, I, I just saw the one for Ghost Dog, and that's all I'm going to say. And we'll look at it later. <laughs> um, yes, uh, then you can uh, watch all the after parties for free, which tend to be even more irreverent and uh, very hilarious. I would, I would say. Of course, sometimes there's good Muppet them. content. Sometimes there's bad Muppet content. You never know. You, you never, never know, know people. <laughs> never know. Uh, um, anyway, letterbox one liners. Um, I, I would love to for us. So, letterbox, of course, is a social media site for film. It's a bottom up democracy. Everybody gets to have their say, not just the Siskels and Eberts. Uh, everybody gets to talk about the movies they love, the movies that they did not love, the movies they were baffled by, the movies they were weirdly thirsty for. Uh, and it's a Everybody gets to have their say of any kind. Best expressed, of course, in the classic one-liner format, working on their tight five on the internet as people used to do before they were doom scrolling. And these are the letterboxed one-liners for the third man. Forrest, roll them. 
Orson Welles is arguably the most evil thing ever uttered on a Ferris wheel. Yeah, we didn't even talk about his actual <laughs> feet. I definitely wanted to before we... I, we didn't even talk about the Ferris wheel, yeah. We didn't? I mean, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, clearly, we got more to discuss. But, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not... Brendan O'Hare is not wrong here. That is, seriously... He compares yeah. people to fucking ants on the like on the thing. He's like, how many of those yeah. dots would you take out if I said you could get twenty thousand dollars a time? Yeah, free of income tax. <laughs> free of income tax. That's yeah. your that's your libertarian friend. He's like, listen, it doesn't really matter. It's free of income tax. Just shut the fuck up and kill the and people. You, and have you heard about the age of consent here? No, <laughs> it's in the sewers. <laughs> <laughs> the zither player really earned that title card. Damn right. <laughs> Dude, I just months before we even decided to do this, I, I would have the third man soundtrack just playing in my head. Like, I feel like once you hear it, you, it doesn't disappear. You always have the third man soundtrack. <laughs> I can't believe there's people that don't like it. That's what bothers me. Oh, Lord. What's wrong with you? I don't want to meet those real. people. And if I ever find out one of those people's on the show, I'm kicking that person off this show. <laughs> That's now all <laughs> our on question. the show. Just to kick them off the show. Yeah, the dad is I heard you don't like not extravaganza a questionnaire. <laughs> That's the long game, man. Damn. <laughs> we all have that friend who fucking sucks. <laughs> the drill really? one too. At the drill review, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one of his like twelve reviews. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's it's great. Game respect. Game. No, but he really does. He really does suck. He and, really does suck. Yeah. And but but then there's the whole dialogue where she's talking about how great he is and how they like they're in love and all this stuff. And it's like, no, that guy fucking sucks. Like I, Holly Martin sucks a little bit. He's kind of just sad and like drunk all the time. But he's still better than like like libertarian uh, Ferris wheel. I'm gonna kill as many people as possible. Guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a little. <laughs> Orson Welles is wrong. The Swiss have given us far more than just the cuckoo clock. We've gotten watches, chocolate, and shadowy immoral banking institutions. <laughs> oh, and Harry Lyme should know all about those. That's probably where he stashes his money. Like Maybe. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the progen. Uh, the pro. That's the origin story of the Swiss bank. Yeah. Oh. Maybe. I don't know. Orson Welles' character in this is Harry Lyme would 100 percent be the person that like stashes a bunch of Nazi gold. <laughs> oh yeah oh for sure Are you kidding the Nazis you, sh you shouldn't give it back to the Nazis come on <laughs> everyone asks who the third man is not how the third man is oh single, single oh, tier. you know maybe, maybe well, if he was uh, asked that more often he wouldn't be the villain of the movie <laughs> right exactly <laughs> he's in love with Anna he taps on the glass exactly a little empathy people come on come on <laughs> just, just, just just a touch of empathy though just, yeah. <laughs> But, but that was that, that was a rejected what? title for Touch of Evil, by the way. Yeah, no, that was uh, that was my, that was my, <laughs> uh, my joke that I was saying. Touch of empathy. <laughs> if Harry Lyme were alive today, he'd be a six-term U.S. senator. Yeah, Ooh. that's just a fact, Zach, right there. And yeah. he'd be represented by Big Pharma. Sometimes love don't feel like it should, baby. Hurts so good. <laughs> Cobblestone propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big cobblestone paid for this movie. Exactly. <laughs> hey, can you wet it a little bit more? I don't think it's wet enough. They need to see how wet this cobblestone is. I need it to shine, baby. I need some petroleum jelly on this cobblestone. <laughs> I don't think it's moist enough in here. People need to know how wet this cobblestone really gets. Listen, Vienna is a humid place. It's humid. <laughs> It's gotta be wetter. Redo it's it. In, it's good in all environments, not so much dry, but you know, wet environments. <laughs> <laughs> he should have just gone to the airport. Well, yeah, like, yeah. So many times, he, there's so many chances for him just to go to the airport. <laughs> every scene is another chance, and every scene he thinks about it, and he decides at the last minute, oh, I'm just gonna go check out one more thing. You know what, David Selznick, fuck you in 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 the grave because. It's very clear why he doesn't go home. It's very clear why he doesn't go home. He just keeps on having dumb things to think of because he doesn't have, you're right. He doesn't have anything at home. Like he yeah. just keeps on the small things. Someone's like, he's like, Hey, did you say I should stay? I should stay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I just, could just uh, go home and be broke there. Yeah, it's just, it's just, just like Columbo. There's just one more thing. <laughs> do you want to go home and be broke where the economy is starting to boom? Or do you want to go home and be broke where everyone's broke? And you don't feel so bad about yourself for being drunk in the sewer. Hey, hey. <laughs> 
a case study and why you should never let a zither player get dirt on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> makes you want to chill in a sewer not not as much fun in 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 the u.s i i I bet as it is in vienna in vienna it seems like top class sewer chilling yeah Yeah. no no europe (laughs) all of europe has just gorgeous sewers um look at her look at the sewer uh, on her uh, if, if you ever, um, <laughs> I got to see um, Neverwhere introduced by Neil Gaiman, and, and he talked about how beautiful the London sewers are and how they got to film it on location there. But because the way they filmed it, the sets looked about as realistic as they set up Doctor Who, which is weird. <laughs> I'm glad you got one more of those. Uh, <laughs> yes, hey, this episode of Movie Night Extravaganza apparently brought to you by Doctor Who. Uh, anyway, those are the letterbox one-liners for the third man. Uh, follow the show Movie Night Extravaganza on Letterbox. That's this guy over here, uh, not not Spider Man uh, Forest. <laughs> uh, am I Spider Man? Have you ever seen me and Spider Man in the same room? No. You know. Well, uh, you don't tell me. You and Toby McGuire, yes, but you and Andrew Garfield, no. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. that, 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 that's a master party stuff. So Christina's going to be on that. Uh, I, of course, am Kona Neutrons. Follow me on there as well. I'm very active. Uh, J. Andrew World, also a letterbox user. He doesn't just review Doctor Who. He also reviews weird movies that you maybe are not familiar with also. <laughs> he uh, doesn't just review Doctor Who. He reviews Doctor What. As in what? Doctor Watt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, J- Josh- why did I watch this? <laughs> <There she is. laughs> it, it's 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 like the Beetlejuice rules, right? Except for you only have to do it once. Uh, Josh, I don't think you're 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 not in Letterbox, right? No, no. Okay, it, it's great to keep track of what movies you uh, want to watch, if nothing else. So. That's yeah, no, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Br- brought that's, to you by that's... not a sponsor, Letterbox. We just give them all this free content for. <laughs> I, I recognize one of our, like one of our Letterbox uh, things recently, though. Oh. The Edge, not <laughs> not one of our classic cinema ones. It's, that's the one, huh? Maybe it's maybe we're the first people ever to review it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> like and like because of Charlie, we all did. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> that is that bit andy please take it away all right if you're watching us right now on twitch make sure you do um uh, make sure you mean ads is what i hear yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're watching oh, an ad right now uh so, yeah, so you're not hearing this because you're watching some ads <laughs> thank you so much for watching the ads because um ah, show- ads <laughs> <laughs> You'll watch you these on Twitch. We know the yeah. website. If you can subscribe, uh, please do so. And if you happen to have an Amazon Prime account, you can subscribe for free. And that actually does help us out. Um, if you're watching us over on YouTube, uh, do the YouTube stuff. Like, subscribe, comment helps. Uh, and the big ask, watch the video to the end. I know that's a big ask, but you got great Conan music. So so what's, what's your problem with that? Um, you shouldn't be complaining about that. Screw you, buddy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we tried writing a theme song. So there. If you don't, um, if you don't like the zither, you know what? I'm going to invite you on the show just so I can kick you off. We should, we, we should we, do a derivation of that ZZ Top shirt. If you don't like the zither, fuck you. <laughs> Tell him I wish you had used only a zither for, for the, uh, for the know, intro. Screwed up. <laughs> Yeah. Um, anyways, if you are um, uh, inclined to support us some more, we have a Patreon that lets you watch all of our uh, after parties, not just the one uh, that's live, but but you can go back right. in the past and see what got me banned from Facebook. Oh, um, <laughs> yes. And we're going to be uh, having an after party, you know, right yes. right after this. Um, yes. With the lovely so, Christina is going to be joining. You, know, you, and, can, and, you can see it live. Everyone gets it live, but, you know, only the patrons get to party forever. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Exactly. And, and um, the the other nice thing is if uh, we we do have uh, if you, if you don't like looking at our faces, um, we have an audio version, so you can wonder why they stop and laugh in the middle of like stupid yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, And uh, that that's also available. And if if you're inclined, please uh, please give us a review on iTunes. Um, that also helps us out if you're if you're an iTunes subscriber. We're some needy motherfuckers. Yes, but, you know. We just need all of your love. <laughs> we need we need you on every app. We need you to come through on every app. Support us on every single social media. All platforms. Right. <laughs> Light up um, the sky for, so for uh, I have, almost a reversal. Ah, I, uh, moving next I, have, I have one more. I have one more clip to play, and I wanted this to be uh, part of the conversation on Orson Welles' role. This is uh, Peter Bogdanovich talking about Orson Orson Welles, his his uh. The guy he let move into his second bedroom. 
Um, That's right. <laughs> Forgot about that. Yeah. Which um oh I, I should say this before we before we play this um they gave uh I, I don't think they they touch on this in, in this clip but they gave uh, Orson Welles the ability to either take a percentage of the movie or to uh, get paid right up front and he was so broke in in, in Europe like kind of like wandering around at this point it's when the McCarthy stuff was going on too so he ended up saying no I need the money now and then this became the most financially successful movie um <laughs> that he was ever in yeah that's that's sad oof. A bummer. It's about the third man. Also, is this extraordinary black and white photography? That you can feel the wetness in the stones of Vienna. You know, Orson used to refer to black and white as the actor's friend. And I, why do you say that? He said, well, he says, you know, every performance is better in black and white. Name me a great performance in color. I defy you. <laughs> and you know, it, it is hard to to. To think of great performances in color there is something about black and white it's the lack of distraction you don't sit there saying aren't those blue eyes beautiful or isn't that hair color nice it focuses on the dramatic i once um, said to orson welles my god that role of harry lime is you're so great in that picture and he said well he said that's the part it's the greatest star part ever written and you know what a star part is he says that's what they talk about you for an hour and then you appear. He said, I did it on the stage, one called Mr. Wu. Everybody for the first 45 minutes of the play says, you know, but what will happen when Mr. Wu gets here? And yes, but what will Mr. Wu say about this? And wait till we find out what Mr. Wu thinks and all that. And he says, and everybody boils around the stage as Orson said for about almost an hour talking about Mr. Wu. And then just at the end of the first act, in the distance on the stage, crossing a, a bridge, comes the small figure of Mr. Wu. And everybody goes, ah, Mr. Wu. And the curtain comes down and the audience comes out and says, isn't that actor playing Mr. Wu great? <laughs> Orson said, that's a star part for you. He, he always said that he had no influence over the production, except that he wrote that speech about the cuckoo clock, which is the one speech everybody remembers from the picture. But when I asked him whether he'd influenced Carol Reed, he said, Carol Reed was a hell of a director and didn't need my opinion. However, I think it's important to note that the look of the third man, and in fact, the whole film, would be unthinkable without Citizen Kane, The Stranger, and The Lady from Shanghai, which Orson made in the 40s, and all of, all of which preceded The Third Man. Carol Reed, I think, was definitely influenced by Orson Welles, the director, from the films he had made, whether or not there was any conscious conversation about shooting things a certain way or not. I'm, that probably wasn't the case, because Carol Reed was awfully good, and he was a you know good craftsman and knew what he was doing. The picture is very daring, very fast-cutting, probably the greatest of the foreign film noirs. You know, It's just one of those extraordinarily happy accidents which isn't to be patronizing because Casablanca is that can be called that too, kind of an extraordinarily happy accident. But when you see the third man, it doesn't seem accidental. Everybody, I think, knew what they were doing, and it's it's a, it's a great film. I want friends that ride as hard for me as uh, Peter Bogdanovich does for Orson <laughs> Welles, where he's like, he's like, did he influence the film? Well, all filmmaking really is influenced by Citizen Kane. So. <laughs> yeah, so he's yes. not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. What, what, I don't what, think you can make a movie I... without really being, you know, inspired by uh, Orson Welles. He's, you know, the center of. Of, of gravity really in this whole situation <laughs> that's why he's so big because you know a larger mass has more gravity it collected more yeah absolutely <laughs> and as his mass got bigger you know his his influence got his, his larger influence grew. Yes. that's why he finally became a planet eating planet <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it was the role he was born to play absolutely <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah man uh Parmesan. Oh, <laughs> fermented in the bottle. <laughs> I, I like that he just, it, it, it's, it's the, and having seen Other Side of the Wind and the They're Gonna Miss When I'm Dead too, like, and mm. knowing that, like, why he's doing that, 
is to like you know fund this passion project that's where basically he's been abandoned by everyone that like potentially could uh, from conventional means yeah. but then also just like the level of disdain and like disinterest he has in the thing that he's actually doing and the fact that he's just loaded too is just, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a classic it's a classic uh american moment really yeah well if you read more about that commercial like he actually was friends with the director and he was kind of doing it as a favor to a certain point, particularly that one, he's just like, I don't want to do. Oh God, okay, fine. I guess I'm gonna and... get. I guess I'm going to get drunk beforehand. <laughs> oh, I get as much uh, drink as I want to on set. You need some of that uh, champagne. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Sam, I want wine. Wine. Oh, 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 if I drink enough, maybe this California Palmasan will go down. Okay, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't do anything. <laughs> um, yeah, but but yeah, I think that that's kind of a, a fascinating look at um, you know number one, kind of Orson Welles' uh, theatricality, right? Like he's thinking about all all these things in terms of like a star role, and you know Peter Bogdanovich is doing the kind of thing that Andy does by just distracting and talk more about Mr. Wu than he did about uh, <laughs> the third man in that clip, but. Yeah. But it is it is interesting that he thinks about it in terms of that because I think that is the most famous one of those kinds of things where it's like because you know there's like waiting for Godot as a play where I mean Godot doesn't show up in the play but like it's the same kind of thing right like the character the characterization yeah. like oh we're waiting for this person this person's really important they really have to show up and you know in terms of that like Harry Lyman in this everybody like the whole movie is about him even when he's not in it even when he just has one scene one yeah. speech really you know yeah he's the center he's the uh the protagonist whether he's there or not yeah so i kind of find that uh fascinating the fact that they pick a, a an incredibly like mysterious city to film it in and the silhouettes and you know the shadowiness of it um and kind of playing tricks on you whether he's even there when he shows up or not i mean he finally is but like you're thinking yeah. like hey is this just kind of like an alcoholic hallucination this guy is having and he sees his dead friend like right. But I even just like that little tip beforehand where 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 she says, "Oh, Catalina likes Harry," and then I'll do 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 do. do, do. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, I wonder who that could be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I so I don't know. This is a great this is a great movie. Um, I so that speech that he gives I think is really uh, it's disturbing. It's a disturbing speech to hear on a Ferris wheel. Um, but but there's a lot. Well, I mean, it does break yeah. one of my life rules: is never go on a Ferris wheel a libertarian. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also like this moment where he's staring, smart. staring, he's staring at um, he, he looks at he looks at Holly and he's like, the only thing that's really getting in my way, the only reason anyone would know that I'm here is you. And he gives him that really disdainful look where you're like, he's thinking about pushing him off the fucking Ferris wheel. Yeah. And <laughs> and then Holly gives him the list of everyone that he's talked to. And, oh, never mind. It just closes the door. <laughs> like, ah, 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 fuck it. It's hard. Yeah, never mind. Yeah, it's not like a big fan of ass, whatever. I better, I better be able to trust these goddamn Russians is all I'm saying. <laughs> I'm giving people up to. <laughs> Callaway knows I'm not dead. Ah, fine. They dug up the, dug up the body. Okay. <laughs> okay. Forget it. Yeah, well, that, that also is kind of fascinating, too, that the one, you know, it's not... Um, the, the porter sees him get hit by the car or get sees someone get hit by the car, but it doesn't necessarily know that it's, you know, he can't see the face of who got hit by the car really. So, right. it, you know, it's somebody else that they push their connect that was going to the police and working with their, you know, with, uh, with Callaway, they push him in front of the car essentially. You know what I mean? And like, um, it, it's kind of fascinating. They realize the third man is someone that we've never, we haven't seen. We haven't really heard anything about. And it's, he's the one in the fucking, you know, the casket. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Hinkle. It's, or, a, it's a classic things. MacGuffin in that way, you know, mm -hmm. like conceptually, I'd say. But yeah, it's interesting to think about how much, and again, it's 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 all in that 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 facial expression, just and and his you know his movements. He's realized that the game is essentially up at that point, and it's it's a really a matter of time, like how long he can stay in the Russian quadrant of town because it's not he can't stay there forever. I don't think because he's not he, like something in his in his behavior says that to me. I don't know if that's yeah. you know meant to be yeah. there or not well he kind of says kinda he just, says i can't trust anybody anymore you know like i yeah like, people are starting to already kind of get through it like through with me like i'm not providing anything for them now right <laughs> and so it's that it's that hinge it's the same it's the it's the it's the fucking moon river of this movie where everything just turns turns the yeah. other way just like a ferris wheel yeah <laughs> Just like a, <laughs> um, say, just like the merry-go-round. <laughs> uh, but Josh, uh, we do final thoughts. You know, where you give um, anything else you wanted to add to the conversation, or you know that we didn't get to, or uh, you oh. know, just a summary. 
Gosh, yeah, uh, nothing I can think of that we didn't get to. I mean, it's just it's an amazing movie. Um, mm. You know, it's it's even just every time I rewatch it, I don't get some, necessarily get something new about it every time, but I just enjoy it so much. And just I love getting lost in that world, in that you know that black and white world um is so wonderful and the performances i mean we talk about orson welles but joseph cotton does a fantastic job alita valley does a, an amazing job and that's really it's, it's which joseph cotton is kind of a the um holly martin's to uh you know orson welles yeah and, and as, as actual like, people yeah 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 they were they were good friends and uh every once in a while orson would uh would throw him a throw him a roll yeah you know, <laughs> including you know the best one of the best movies of all time citizen kane oh, i've heard of that uh, i've heard of that one. <laughs> <laughs> i thought you were gonna say the magnificent ambersons uh <laughs> back to back back there you go there you go yeah fantastic it's movie. no crow too that's all i gotta say <laughs> <laughs> actually it was meddled with by the studio just like crow 2 mm. Hey. <laughs> a little bit of something but yeah uh one of my favorites and i'm glad you guys had me on to uh to talk about it appreciate it are you gonna stay around for the after party for a little bit yeah sure i want to bring up something in terms of uh that, that the posters reminded me of okay right. great it's not really the third man at all <laughs> yeah, that that's fine i doubt most of the after party will be either they cool. made <laughs> Some some of them we purposely go off topic. See dead or alive. We got to talk about something else. This is <laughs> this, this is too much. <laughs> fair, fair. Uh, Conan. Oh, me next. Oh, okay. So, yeah, this is uh, you know, like I said, not quite a noir, not quite a thriller. It's it's got you know, twists, turns, atmospheric tension. It's noir. It's a noir. Noir. It's, it, well, it's got zither. It's got hey. so much zither. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I love that for it, you know. Um, I, I like that uh, the, our sensible protagonist is a is a, like I said, a, like a hack writer visiting his lifelong friend and <laughs> could leave at any time. And he chooses not to, in the classic noir sense of you know being, being drawn into the danger. Uh, you know, it's mysterious, it's alluring, um, it's gloomy, it's moody. The cinematography is incredible, mm. uh, and all the leads are great. But like, yeah, th this is. This is Orson Welles, the most hideous man alive. <laughs> uh, this is Orson's movie. And, He's magnificent. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it, it is. It is truly great. And uh, you know, the, like I, I, since we we've only referenced it, I think with one of the, the letterbox reviews, uh, I'm just going to read the quote. In Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. But I like how he, he, he actually goes up and goes, the cuckoo clock. He's like, <laughs> <old man. laughs> so yeah. casual. The cuckoo clock. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that gives you an idea of like, like how like this, I mean, the, the, like he's uh, luck. Uh, Lime is like one of the iconic noir uh, characters, I think. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm glad that we fit this in for movie noir extravaganza because it's uh if you're trying to understand like what makes this genre interesting or cool or why certain things are the way they are that this is definitely a, this is the movie that uh has a very key part of it and, and it also happens to be a great start, movie uh, if you're wondering whether you want to start a zither uh band you know <laughs> like i love that there were like not one but two of the letterbox one-liners that referenced like the, the zither guy like had had <laughs> got one over on like on someone or like blackmailing <laughs> someone that's great because there is so much zither and like like i said i know people that like were like what is up with that annoying noise I'm like you mean the zither <laughs> so, oh, I yeah. know. so it's 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 probably the best walking around soundtrack of any of any ah, movie that i can think of like i have to agree and i, I, I think it's yeah. I, I think it's stunning and, and also by the way great ending yeah oh yeah also love the ending i think i think the ending is is very uh very it's, interesting very cool uh very notable but anyway it, it strips uh, away his dignity and i think orson welles is someone that did have his dignity stripped away in life but like you yeah. know kind of strips like completely strips away of any of his uh mystery and stuff they built up the whole time like no this 100%. guy was just kind of running through a sewer that falls into the sewer <laughs> like exactly <laughs> yeah yeah before the teenage mutant Ninja Turtles even made it cool <laughs> 
And he mentions uh, Michelangelo. Or you could get pizza delivery, apparently. Anyway, he mentions sorry. Michelangelo. He mentions uh, you know, he does the, the make Leonardo <laughs> and Michelangelo in there. Hey. Wow, it's all coming together. It's all coming together, people. <laughs> Connect the dots. <laughs> what did Master Splinter come up with? <laughs> Andy, let's hear about oh, yeah. Mr. Wu. What well, Mr. Wu. All sewer cops are bastards, too. I forget <laughs> yes. No, um, uh, yeah, this movie is is one of those that that uh, uh, comic artists always talk about. Um, oh, like, do they? Because you haven't talked about it really at all. <laughs> um. Well, no, no, because all the mockery with the whole you know Barry Crickson reference uh, with his beautiful comic Master Race, which is fantastic, you know, and everybody like, like if you read one comic, like like that is it right there. It's eight pages, you know, you're you're not obligated to much. Uh, uh, it, it, there's a great story behind it, but I, I, I'm not even going to get into that. But anyways, no, um, uh, you can see its influence on like you know Jack Kirby uh, with those Dutch angles and and Neil Adams. Uh, you know, who just recently passed away um, and, and so many more. Uh, Will Eisner, of course. I'm, oh, sure. Will Eisner. Yeah. Um, and and uh, so, so like th this, and I actually remember hanging out at uh, the Word of Pictures Museum uh, back in the 90s uh, with Kevin Eastman, the creator of the Ninja Turtles, and hearing people talk about this movie. Um, so like it is a very important film, um, you know, to to not just filmmakers, but but to the visual arts as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and it absolutely is like a masterclass of like pacing and lighting and just like you want to sit there and like with your sketchbook and, and uh, figure out what yeah. they're doing in every single frame. Which, yeah, which what, kind what of makes it interesting that uh, Citizen Kane is kind of like that too, right? Like, I Yeah, mean, no, no. Citizen Kane even more yeah. so. Um, yeah. Two great uh, examples fact, of just that that every frame of picture kind of mentality. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, but but I think this is even more so because because you do have that whole uh, – um, you know, the, the Neil Adams, you know, was such a giant as far as influence. And, and there's just so many people who, who like learned at his feet that went on to become masters of their own, like, you know, Bernie Wrightson mm -hmm. and, uh, um, 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 Frank Miller, you know, just, just, just like Sin, Sin City, like, yeah. Right. <laughs> Alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you can, you know, again, like, like this is just, um, it's just, it's all like, like the, this is, this is the meals that, uh, uh, great artists, uh, digest to, to, um, create great art. So, yeah. Uh, it was, it was great to be able to watch this and talk about it. Cause I can't remember the last time I've seen this movie. Of course. Um, you know what, you know what, uh, great artists, uh, drink <laughs> along with their, with their art, Paul Masson. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, no, they I had like a case of it in college. <laughs> ah, comic books, the oh, my <laughs> art. Does it draw anything? <laughs> um, we will serve no wine before it's time. <laughs> well, my my uh final quote that I wanted to you know throw in here, um. Would you feel any pity if any of those dots stopped moving forever? If I offered you $20,000 for every dot that stopped, would you tell me to keep my money or would you calculate how many dots you could afford to spend? Free of income tax, good man. Free of income tax.